Endocrine disruptors or endocrine disrupting chemicals are a critical topic that affects every single one of us. Let me show you why. These are chemicals that we may be exposed to every single day that can potentially wreak havoc on our hormones, leading to a variety of health issues. But what exactly are they? How do they interfere with our endocrine system? And more importantly, which ones should we be most concerned about? Stick around as we count down the five worst endocrine disruptors you need to know about and why you should avoid them. Also guys, give this video a like and subscribe down below so you don't miss out on future videos. So I'll go ahead and just say this. Your quality of life is tied back to your endocrine system. These organs here, like your hypothalamus, pituitary, thyroid, testes, etc., are gonna be the glands that send hormones into your bloodstream that tell cells and other organs what to do. Think of your hormones like ways your organs talk to each other. They can affect everything from your overall well-being, growth, puberty, your mood, libido, which can affect your marriage, and then energy levels tied back to your reproductive health. Now imagine something coming in and blocking the communication pathway inside you. That's what we're dealing with. It's a huge deal. And every day we're surrounded by hundreds or thousands of chemicals. Not all of them are harmful, but the ones that might be can be found in our food, drinking water, toys, and that includes adult toys too, the air we breathe, and believe it or not, even in our furniture. Some people forget that furniture and mattresses are often treated with chemicals so that if there ever was a fire, they will burn more slowly. Same issue with carpets. And when a person is exposed to endocrine disruptors, it'll interfere with how the hormones in your body talk to the other organs and relay important biological messages. The four ways it disrupts it is one, it can mimic a natural hormone, which creates an unbalanced response in the body by confusing it. Two, it can disrupt your insulin levels, which can contribute to a bunch of metabolic problems. Three, it can prevent hormones from binding to receptors so the chemical signals and messages never get passed on. And four, it can block the production of hormones and receptors, which can cause an under or overproduction of certain homo hormones, which could be a total mess. And speaking of that mess, which hormones specifically are we talking about? I'll focus on the five ones that might be relevant to you guys without going into too much detail. Just know for each of these hormones, they'll either block it, mimic it, or alter its production. The first one is estrogen. Now we can make an entire video on just on the estrogen aspect alone, but to be brief, in women, imbalances in estrogen levels can lead to irregular menstrual cycles, fertility problems, and an increased risk of PCOS. In men, as elevated estrogen levels can reduce sperm production and lead to fertility issues. It can also result in gynecomastia. Now guys, there are many other trickle-down effects of when estrogen is imbalanced, like bone density changes, hormone-related cancers, etc. But that pretty much covers the first hormone that it affects. Secondly, it's going to involve your thyroid hormones too. The big one here is the chemical perchlorate, which is infamously known to block the uptake of iodine. In a bit, we will talk about ways to avoid perchlorate, but without enough iodine, the thyroid gland can't produce adequate levels of T4 and T3, which leads to hypothyroidism or an underactive thyroid. The third hormone is your testosterone levels. In men, you get lower sperm count, infertility, lower motivation to do tasks, take risks, mood changes, and etc. Now, women need testosterone to be at normal levels too. A big issue is a loss of muscle mass, libido, mood changes, and lower bone density in women who don't have enough testosterone. The fourth hormone that endocrine disruptors can disrupt is your melatonin levels. So sleep disturbances, including difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, and achieving restorative sleep. If you're having trouble with these, see if endocrine disruptors could be the cause. Switch to a non-toxic mattress and bed sheets to see if it helps your sleep. Now let's turn our attention to the first endocrine disruptor, which is BPA or bisphenol A. These are going to be found mainly in polycarbonate plastics and epoxy resins. Let me show you the six most common places it's found. Canned foods, containers, bottled water, sunglasses, wine and beer, and get these guys, store receipts. Many thermal paper receipts contain BPA. So what I do is I always try to opt for electronic receipts and you should do the same if you can. You don't wanna to be touching receipts. Quickly, I'm gonna show you this from a 2010 study that gets overlooked when they measured urinary BPA concentrations in 84 women, mean age being around 35.6 years old. 
they found that BPA was detected in the urine of the majority of women undergoing IVF and was inversely associated with the number of oocytes retrieved and peaked estradiol levels, which I thought was interesting. If you have to use plastic, because let's face it, we are a civilization that plastic basically runs our lives, opt for the safer ones, number two, four, and five. Other things you could do is avoid heating plastics, avoid canned foods, and opt for BPA-free baby products. Secondly, we need to discuss per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS. These are man-made chemicals used as oil and water repellents and coatings for a lot of your everyday products. These include cookware, carpets, textiles. Unfortunately, they don't break down when they are released into the environment. This is why they're called forever chemicals. They technically stay with us forever. Perfluoral octanoic acid or PFOA is an example. And when PFOA was delivered to pregnant rats, they produced male offspring with decreased levels of 3 beta and 17 beta hydroxysterodehydrogenase, which is a gene that transcribes for proteins involved in the production of sperm. And that's just one example. There are so many others too. Now it's hard to say how much exposure you need for these results to be replicated in humans. But what we do know is that even low doses of endocrine disrupting chemicals may be unsafe because remember, the body's normal endocrine functioning involves very small changes in hormone levels. Yet we know even these small changes can cause significant developmental and biological effects. So what do we do? Avoid non-stick cookware, opt for alternatives such as stainless steel or cast iron. If you're buying carpets or upholstery, choose untreated fabrics or those labeled as PFAS free. And to illustrate, here are eight places where these chemicals are found. A surprising one to me was your popcorn bags, but honestly, anything that is grease resistant packaging, keep an eye out and avoid them. I don't want to spend too much time on this one, but unfortunately there are no laws in the United States requiring manufacturers to warn consumers that an item was made with these substances. Though a new bill did pass in California AB 1817, which phases out the chemicals in clothing and textiles sold in that state. So generally speaking, you're better off assuming that something does contain forever chemicals, particularly if you find keywords like waterproof, stain repellent or dirt repellent on the tag. You might want to avoid them for now until more clarity is established. The third one is perchlorate, which we mentioned earlier. You could find it in fireworks and it's also a component in rocket fuel, but it sadly contaminates much of our produce and much of our milk. And when perchlorate gets into your body, it competes with iodine, like we mentioned, which the thyroid gland needs to make thyroid hormones, right? Basically, this means that if you ingest too much of it, you can end up altering your thyroid hormone balance, which then leads to a number of different issues. So one way to limit your exposure is to drink reverse osmosis water, buy local and organic produce, and opt for grass-fed dairy products. The fourth one is one you've probably already heard of from the frog study, which is atrazine. Let's play a clip. You can look at into the scientific research and they call it male feminization. Like, I don't know if you've heard of atrazine. Mm -hmm. It's in the Midwest it's, everywhere. Yeah, it's in the drinking water. Totally illegal in Europe, by the way. In America, it's the second most used after glyphosate. Like for example, if you have a frog and you've got him in 200 nanograms per deciliter of atrazine, 200, that male frog turns female. Now you've got a female frog. So 200 takes yeah. a male frog and turns a female. How much is allowed in our drinking water? 3,000. Holy crap. The feminization of male frogs actually baffled me. I'm not sure if this study was ever replicated or not, but it is interesting that even at low levels of the atrazine turn male frogs into female ones that produce completely viable eggs. I would like to see it replicated, of course, but we can't deny the incidents in Washington where 805 cases and 3,616 control subjects were identified, and maternal exposure of gastroschisis occurred more frequently among those who resided less than 25 kilometers from a site of high atrazine concentration. But of course, one would argue correlation doesn't equal causation. So one way to limit your exposure because you can't fully avoid atrazine forever is if you hire a landscaping service Ask them to avoid using atrazine-based products on your property. Even better if your neighbors are on board too. You can also eat organic foods and drink filtered water to limit the exposure of atrazine. And lastly, I wanted to touch base on phthalates. 
Using data from the 2011 to 2012, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, Meeker and Ferguson identified decreases in serum testosterone in relation to increases in urinary phthalate metabolite levels, specifically those of DEHP among older men. And the easiest place to get your phthalates is from fast food. Another study conducted between 2003 and 2010, analyzing data from over 8,000 individuals found that those who reported that they had eaten at a fast food restaurant had much higher levels of two separate phthalates, DEHP and DINP in their urine. If you think about it, if one in three Americans are eating fast food on any given day, exposure to phthalates are quite high then. A good place to start with this one is to avoid plastic food containers, children's toys, some phthalates are already banned in kids' products, which is a good sign. And plastic wrap made from PVC, which has the recycling label number three on it. And I know this may sound revolutionary, but maybe practicing cooking with whole organic foods and limiting fast food is a good approach. Because if the research is growing, wouldn't it be better to err on the side of caution until more clarity is established? Because let's say if these chemicals were to get banned tomorrow, that doesn't mean exposure to them will end as well. Because the concern over endocrine disruptors is rooted in their quote unquote potential to interfere with hormone systems and contribute to health issues. The keyword here is potential, which I know can be controversial on its own. The growing body of evidence and regulatory actions kind of underscore the importance of addressing these chemicals urgently. That's why there's no real sense of urgency. Is that a good or bad thing? Let me know in the comments. However, what I will say is that com the complexity of their effects are an ongoing scientific research means that while there's no reason for concern, the extent of the risks and the best strategies of mitigation are still being explored. And that was the purpose of the video. I just wanted to point you guys to the discussion that is being debated among researchers, scientists, politicians, and lawmakers to see the best way to limit harmful substances from our daily lives because oftentimes we are on our own, especially here in the US. But I'm more curious to hear from you guys. Do you want me to make a part two of this topic? Of course, we didn't mention all the chemicals, but good ones to start paying attention to. If you want a part two, just comment down the word part two. And if it gets a lot of requests, I'll be sure to make one. Until then, guys, subscribe if you found this video helpful. And I'll see you guys on the next one.